So you know about the concept of interrupts. So let's take a look at a general concept of finite state machines. Ooh. And let's see. I want to see. Oh, wow, I don't really cover much on that. So let's look at uh, um, something a little bit different. So let me think about an application. Did I cover the application earlier about uh, you're sailing on a sailboat and you're measuring stuff? I did not do that? Mm, okay. So let's take that example. Imagine here I am out in the uh, uh, out in the uh, sound of North Carolina at the Outer Banks, right? And you're familiar with uh, maps associated with depth in oceans and bodies of water. You familiar with that? Yes? On maps? Yes? Okay. Well, maybe I have, I need more detailed information than I, what I give because my map only says uh, zero and then 10 feet and then 20 feet and whatever. And I have the sailboat and it has a keel and uh, it has a rudder, of course. And you know what the keel is for in a sailboat, right? Oh man, you're going to learn about sailing today. So you have this thing in the middle of a, uh, a typical sailboat, not a catamaran, but a typical sailboat called a keel, and it keeps the boat from moving sideways because the wind is really interesting and how you use the sail and the rudder and the keel allows you to actually sail against the wind. And let's just say that this keel can go down into the water about two feet. Yeah, usually, let's say three feet. Who's a sailor here? Are you a sailor man? No, Okay. Anybody a sailboater or a sailor? there be no pirates here. All right. So here we have a sailboat and I don't want to scrape this thing on the bottom, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, during high tide, you know about high tide and low tide? All right. High tide means that uh, um, the earth's gravitational force is causing a swell in the oceans or the sound. Uh, because the sound is connected to the ocean as well. And uh, there may be a point where at high tide, there's rocks under here. And that distance could be five feet at high tide. But at low tide, this could be two feet, which would be really bad for my sailboat, wouldn't it? And so what I'm going to do is at high tide, I'm just going to sail in my favorite area and maybe do some crisscrossing and record two things. Number one, I'm going to record my current depth using a, a depth sensor of some sort. You know, they have these fish finders and stuff like that, right? And then I'm going to record my GPS location. Does that look good? All right, so here we got my GPS location, and I've got my, uh, um, and I've got my uh, um, depth. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to record data, right? And what do I want to record? Well, I want to put in a record two things. First of all, I, I don't really care about my altitude because I don't think my altitude is going to be that accurate. But I know I'm at high tide, so 
I'll do my charts and use smart people. But I'm going to store the following things. I'm going to store my latitude, my longitude, and my depth. And I think my latitude I could store as a, uh, um, I'm just going to store characters, what the heck, right? So I know I'm going to have latitude xxx dot xxxx, I think is what I'm going to get in GPS machine. In addition to that, I'll have a blank and then xx dot xxxx. And then I'm going to store my depth, which I don't care about anything um, deeper than 99 feet. So I'll just store xx dot x as my depth, as characters. And then I'll have my uh, um, uh, carriage return line feed character. So there we go. That's what I'm going to do. All right? This is my problem that I'm going to work with. Now. I got to think of all the ways I'm getting data. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about an algorithm of how I'm going to collect data once a second. How am I going to collect data once a second? Think about all the things that you think need to be done. So, this is your assignment right now. I might make it a quiz, you never know. But you can get in groups of four, no more than four, please. And think about, well, I tell you what, I'll make it really easy. We're going to work on architecture. Have we talked about computer architecture or the software architecture before? Yes? Computer architect or software architecture is all the different subroutines I might want to run. I haven't talked about it. Well, let's think about all the different things that I might want to run. All right? Think about, I talked about one second. I talked about uh, GPS data. I talked about uh, depth data. I talked about storing. So what I want you to do is to identify... All the functions, I was going to say subroutines, but I'll say functions, that can be in a nice, tidy package for, uh, for this system. Now, here's one question. Are you ever going to write out to the GPS device? No. You can, but let's just say I'm going to go with the default. All right? The default says that I run at, uh, uh, you know, my GPS is running at 9,600 bits per second, uh, odd parity. Uh, two stop bits, um, and it will send me 256 characters. Including the end of file character. All right. And my uh, depth sensor will run at the, the same thing. It'll run at 9,600 bits per second. It will uh, communicate at odd parity, two stop bits. Um, and it will send me I'm thinking of how, how what it could send. Two bytes representing the uh, um, the depth in centimeters. 
Okay? So what I want you to do is identify all the functions that your embedded system, don't even, don't even do algorithms or anything else. Just what I want you to do is to write a function name and what it does. You want me to give you one example? All right. So I'm going to call the function set up GPS UART. Set up the UART needed to receive data from GPS device. Do you want another, one more hint? Yes, no? I'll give you one more, one more. Timer, ISR. So, uh, runs when one second has elapsed set a flag to uh, start measurements. All right, so your goal is to finish this up. Go to it. All right, we are back to talk about uh, embedded systems, specifically this application. And we're going to look at this with respect to uh, um, finite state machines. So one thing to uh, also do is to step back a little bit and say, well, here is a, um, a particular application. And uh, what did I have you do in the last assignment? I had you write up some of the uh, um, some of the states, so to speak, that you would be in, right? So, uh, or the uh, the different types of uh, operations that you would do. So, let's build up a state machine as an example for this. But the first, uh, just to give you a good idea of of what really needs to be included is, let's take a look at the hardware associated with my entire embedded system. So what do I know that I have in my embedded system looking back again at this? Well, what is one external device that I mentioned that I need? GPS. So I've got a GPS device. And what's the other thing I definitely said I needed? So a uh, sonar or depth sensor, right? I'm going to add one more, and you probably don't know about this, and that is an external memory. And external starts with an E. <laughs> and uh, do we have an external memory on our Renaissance board? Isn't it uh, um, you, you write to it with SPI bus? SPI bus, yes? Is everybody asleep still? Oh, yes. All right. So here we have, uh, and then of course we have our own system. And I'm not even talking about having LCDs, but we could have an LCD on this. What the heck? And uh, so I'm going to be uh, connecting in this way. Uh, I'll assume that we have uh, UARTs. And by the way, if we have a UART here, we have what? We have two wires. One is a transmit. Um, let's see. I'll make this a receive because everything will be central here, TX. So this will be an RX and TX. And then for the external memory, it'll be uh, some sort of uh, transmit because you write to it. Later on, well, we will need an RX later, but we'll, uh, we'll look at that later. And we have, as I said here, the LCD. 
So what are the main triggers associated with all of this? What are the main things that will trigger where you're getting data from or when it's time to do something? All right, timer, what timer, how much time? One second. All right, so we said a one second timer. And then um, what else do we have? What do you think is a major uh, way to transition from one place to another? Okay, let me give you a hint here. What does a GPS device have? Data, right? Location data. Now, do we really want to be in, in the main process? Do we want to be interrupted for every single character? Or maybe when we know that all the characters are arri have arrived, right? All right, so, so this is major changes in system, and we'll have minor changes in system. So the major one is all GPS data received. And the minor changes would be every character received. What else? Sonar data received, right? As opposed to every character anything else I'll say one other thing that might be important is um, external memory Let's see, data written and then every byte. Written to external memory. So, based on this, here's a question for you. How many of these are actually interrupts? So, is this an interrupt? <laughs> Got to figure that out. Yes or no? Who votes yes? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. All right, who says no? All right, the answer is yes. Why? Why should that be associated with an interrupt? All right, that means that if you don't do something like going to grab every character out of it, it'll just overwrite every single character as it comes in. So you have to grab every character that comes in from, from the uh, uh, GPS via the UART and temporarily put it somewhere else, all right? So with that in mind, is this associated with an interrupt? Yes. And is this associated with an interrupt? Are you sure? How do you know when to send the next character? Or the next bunch of characters? All right, so this will also be an interrupt. By the way, um, since we're using the SPI byte, 
This will not be a byte. This will be every four bytes written because you could send four bytes at a time with SPI. With the UART, it's just uh, it's just a single byte. Now, let's look at over here. Is the one second timer an interrupt? All right. All the GP GPS data received, is that an interrupt? No. So what would, what would trigger or what we would identify something for that? Flag. All sonar data received? Flag. All the data complete to the external memory? Flag. By the way, when I say um, data complete to external memory, I should be a little bit more specific. That is, um, we're sending the latitude, longitude, and, oh, just like I said right here. The latitude, the longitude, and then the depth with a carriage return line feed. So we're just sending that every, every bit of time. Who sets this flag right there? All right, so the flag will be set. And when will it set that flag? When all the data received. And what do you think will identify that? All right, so an end of data or end of file character. Do you think the same thing would happen for the sonar? All right. And then here, yeah, probably same thing. It would actually, it's not so much an end of, uh, end of file as it is, uh, it'll say no more data to write off to the memory. So what does this tell you of what's going on? in our system. And how do we now organize how everything works? Well, we have right here, we know we have this many interrupt service routines, right? Three, right? Yes, yes, yes. All right. And we have this one up here. Can you think of anything else that would cause us a change in the operating state of our whole device. Did I say that if, if it's too shallow, then freak out or something? Oh, I did? I, did, I said that? Where did I say that? No, oh, I just said I, I want to measure it. I didn't say I'm going to freak out. But I will want to measure it. I, you know, I, if I were to say about two feet, then that would be a little bit more complexity than I want to cover at this point. So now we have organized ourselves in ways that would allow things to change. So what we can do is we can make our life easy by creating what's called a finite state machine. And a finite state machine will start off in an initial state. And usually our initial state is when you're just booting up and you'll start in your initial state. And this is usually the indicator of your first state. And then what do you first do when you're in your initial, uh, in your initial state? When you first boot up with anything, what do you almost always do? All right, so you do your initialization, right? And so, So in your initialization state, you will do your initializing of all the ports, the timers, everything else. And then you will go into your wait state. So I can easily see how I will want to just stay in my wait state until what? All right, until which, which happens, an interrupt or something else? Ah, well. The one second timer will cause me to 
enter a state which is um, the request data state. So in the request data state, I will stay in that state. And inside of that state, I will do what? I will request GPS data. I will request sonar data. By the way, these things may send it, but let's just, let's just make it simple. We go out, we say, give me data, and then it comes back and gives it to us. When do I ever leave this state? When what? All right, when both flags are set, right? So we'll call this the GPS and sonar and these are flags. Which means that um, we will remain in this state whenever we have GPS uh, exclusive or sonar. Oops. We also have to keep in mind, all right, this is not correct. This will be GPS and sonar, not. <coughs> Once we have this, we will enter in the uh, um, right mem state. And we will, in there, we'll actually um, um, build a particular um, string based on all this data that we requested that we got. And then we'll write it out and we will actually leave this state when we get the external memory flag. There we go, there's our state machine. Which means that any time that we want to operate and, uh, and run our program, man, this is way out of focus. Any time that we want to write our program to be able to run in this, we can always say, while in the wait state, do this. And what do you think we do when we're in the wait state? Check what? Ooh, we got a lot of different different opinions here. Who says that we're checking things? Okay, who says that we just sit there and do nothing? Who has no clue what's going on? <laughs> All right. The wait state is exactly that. We're waiting for something to happen. We're waiting for what to happen? The interrupt. <coughs> Excuse me, the one second interrupt. We're waiting for that to happen. So we're going to wait for the request. I'm sorry, we're going to wait for the one second timer. And then inside of this state, which means that we're going to change a state variable. Our states will be initialize, wait, request, write mem. What do you think each one of those states represents? A what? A module in the program? Or a selection in a, uh, uh, in a case statement that's running in the main program that will call other functions, right? And so uh, since we're getting really close to the end of the time, uh, I want to set up this, this structure really quickly, and then we're going to look at another example. And so this structure literally would be, what are we doing? While, correct? And in fact, uh, we're going to enumerate our state, which, there's my glasses.
You know what? This is gonna this is gonna take more than uh, four minutes that I have left. So what I'll do is I will continue it in our next lecture. See you one week from today. Remember, we don't uh, we don't meet on Thursday because why? That's because we are going to be gluttons. All right, we are back and. Let us remember, because uh, all of you may be familiar with the concept that Turkey uh, is uh, one of these drugs that actually helps you forget. And so I'm sure lots of you had turkey over the holidays. Just curious, how many of you had turkey over the holidays? Yeah, we got a lot of vegetarians in here. Okay, so <laughs> it's a wonderful, uh, it's a, uh, a wonderful uh, tradition. All right. Let's go back to this. Remember we said identify all the functions that can be used in a nice tidy package for this system. And the one thing I wanted to point out, and I remember I showed you, uh, um, I showed you some uh, examples of what other people had done. That is defining the architecture, your software architecture. In other words, you're finding small little packages of functionality that you could put in one place or another. And that's important because if I give you a, a more complex problem, you're going to need to identify, oh, okay, to do this big complex problem, you need to reduce it into smaller parts. And so one of the examples of the smaller parts that we did is, oh yeah, set up the GPS UART and we have a timer ISR. If we looked at uh, more of the design, um, we had, uh, we started looking at a finite state machine that what sort of, of phenomena will cause us to change the idea of states or where we're going. So, you know, major changes in the system was the one second timer would tell us that it's time to go out and get uh, GPS data and sonar data. And another major event would be all GPS data has been received, all sonar data has been received, and that the uh, data complete to the external memory. Remember we had an external memory here that we wrote stuff off via uh, SPI bus. We created a finite state machine that said when we first start, we've initialized everything, and then once everything is initialized, we'll never return back to the state, but we'll be either in the wait state, waiting for the one second timer, based on that one second timer, and we'll just sit there in a little loop just doing nothing. When that one second timer comes along, then we actually request data from the GPS and the sonar, and we'll sit in that state, pretty much doing nothing in the main part of the program until we have the GPS and the sonar have come back and said, we've got all the data, all right? Once that happens, GPS and sonar says we have all the data, then there will be a lot of processing that's done here. It'll be written off to the memory. We'll kind of uh, write it off byte by byte, and then when it's all done, we'll go back to the wait state. So the most important thing you have to think about is how do we do this? How do we structure this? Well, you have to think about states and how we're going to identify what state we're in. So do you all remember how to do enumerations in C? Yep. Yes, no? All right, who does not know? I'm gonna give a quiz on this. Oh, all of a sudden we got a lot of people, all right. No, enumerations. All right, today's class, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, how to implement our finite state machine. And so what I've done is I've pre-written up here some of the uh, information. I had some help a little bit earlier from uh, the type def. In other words, we're going to set up four different states that's associated with our state diagram that we did earlier. And so that will help us with our transition between states. So this is a nice compact form of uh, our, our main program, or I should say our, our main function, and then how you would be calling other functions throughout. So now we're going to break off, we're going to uh, talk a little bit uh, in specific, or specifically about some of the other functions, maybe a couple of ISRs. 
So as quiz 20, write the sonar data and write the GPS data ISR. By the way, you could work on this in, do you want to do in pairs or in fours? Oh, wow, that's a resounding four. <laughs> now keep in mind, what do you think has to be done in those ISRs? Reading a character, storing a character, checking, maybe setting a flag. Question? Make sure it's on a clean sheet of paper. Make sure all your names are on it. Go to. Now, we are ready. Uh, so by the way, I, uh, I rewrote this to make it prettier. And I took something out. In the previous one, we had a little bit more in here. But I want to show you, yeah, I just did a little bit of redesign here. So in my timer ISR, and this is the timer ISR. So the timer ISR is the one thing that will have you go from the, the state, the wait state, to the request state. And so in there, I'll actually do the, I'll, I'll make the call the request sonar data, sonar data, because this is going to be nothing more than writing into a, a UART transmit data byte. Good enough. And then I'll do the same thing for the GPS. And in the same way, I'll reset the sonar flag. Sonar flag is what determined that all the, uh, all the bits, or I'm sorry, all the bytes for sonar are in. And the GPS flag, flag. There's no E in flag, right? And oh, by the way, oh, if I could even write correctly. There we go. So I'm going to init the sonar queue and init the GPS queue. In other words, remember our, our queues that we had done for serial communications would allow you to, you know, have the head and the tail start at zero, the certain size of a certain, you know, amount, etc. All right. So now the big thing is, oh, what would I do for those um, for those other functions? And so here's the function for sonar data ISR. Really, all you need to do is check the error flags. Anybody do that? Yeah, this is communications. Check the error flags would be very valuable. Um, although I didn't put in here, check that it will fit. The assumption is that I will never overrun my, my queues because the queue is a certain length and the GPS will only send that certain length. So I'll probably make it a little bit longer so I won't have any problems just in case something happens. And by the way, notify if error, do something if there's an error. For example, maybe send a bite back saying, yeah, I don't, I don't have it. Wow, everybody's now talking, huh? All right. Take that ever, whatever byte you read and put it in your sonar data buffer, data, data buffer. And if the byte that you read is end of file, then set the sonar flag equal one. This is it. There's not that much in there, right? And ISR specifically is very short, just like you see up here. Um, the request sonar data, I'm writing a byte, I'm writing a byte, I'm actually not waiting for anything. I'm setting a flag, I'm setting a flag up here. I'm actually just setting a whole bunch of uh, uh, variable values. Nowhere up here. Oh, and then I also set the current state to request, right? So that's what causes me to, uh, to go, from the, uh, go from the state of 
wait to request is this uh, current state of request. But in this ISR, all I'm doing is I'm setting value and writing to to uh, to peripheral uh, transmission really fast. But this is the one I wanted you to do, of course, one of those ones. And lo and behold, GPS data should be exactly the same, but just with the GPS data you are the GPS uh, here. Notice there's nothing in here where I'm actually doing any decent processing. So in the same way, remember in ISRs, you want to have pretty much devoid of a lot of computation. And you want to do your computation outside. So where would I do that computation outside? Well, if you saw here, right here where it says start write to mem. Now this is not an ISR, right? This is just a function I'm calling inside of the main function. And in this function, it's going to be a lot of the pulling out the specific latitude and longitude from the GPS data. I had mentioned this in a previous class. It would be also in there pulling out the specific depth, identifying that cue that you want to send off to uh, uh, off to memory, and then you would actually start the communications to memory, and you would stay here until uh, some interrupt that came back from the FBI would say um, the right memory flag is. Now notice here what functionality is actually being done in my finite in my state machine. Well, let's see. Uh, with the case, yeah, you know, there's no functionality in here itself, right? If we look at the uh, case request here, um, the only thing we're doing is we're changing a flag. Hmm. All right. What's the uh, work here? Oh yeah, there it is, right there. There's a lot of work there. But once we do it, you see uh, the right memory flag inside this function. You're going to actually set that right memory flag, and then you'll have um, you'll have another change of uh, uh, state once you have verified and sent all of your bytes to the memory. The, the actual function to say I'm done. Should we continue and do the other functions too? Or should I make that another quiz? Hmm. Because now that you've seen the solution for the quiz, you're all sad and want to do it again, right? No, nope, you're, you're good? We're good? <laughs> I like that, no. Well, should I, well, let's, let's continue and do a couple more, uh, do a couple more of these uh, uh, functions in ISRs. Uh, there might be a very big one. So let's take a look at, uh, um, this will be the uh, right memory ISR, and this will be uh, called when a uh, um, Actually, it'll be a long word because it'll be four. Since we're doing SPI, it's going to send four words at one time. When a long word has been uh, successfully uh, uh, written. To memory. Now again, this happens when using SPI, we've sent or we've put in the transmission variable, you know, it's four bytes, when we've sent it all off, and we're waiting back from SPI to tell us it wants more data. So what do you think the first thing we're going to check? If uh, not end of uh, data to write, then we will uh, uh, put uh, 
put data in SPI buffer for uh, memory write. Else, we've run out of uh, stuff to write. What do you think we want to do? We want to set the cur state is going to then be equal to. Wait. And that is simply that ISR. So what kind of processing are we doing? Yeah, we're just writing somewhere and we're just setting a variable. Well, this is pretty easy, isn't it? So the probably the most complex function here that you have other than, you know, setting up the, uh, the variables and such, probably the most complex one is going to be start write to mem. So, no better time like the present to have you write the uh, start write to mem function. And uh, make sure, make this an algorithm. And I'm going to ask that you use pseudocode. I never figured that anybody would be doing flow charts, and that's kind of hard to grade, so do pseudocode. All right? Hey, do you want this to be a quiz? All right, you can do it in groups of four. Go to it. I will give you the final results. So remember, uh, probably should have shown you this on this slide, but I said, this is what I want. You're going to store the latitude, longitude, and depth, right? Um, I should have put on top of that uh, time, because you'd always have a time stamp, right? But since I didn't specify that way up front, I took that off of, you know, I, I'm not going to have you require that for the points. And so, hey, this is what I would have done. So I would have done, uh, of course, all this stuff, you know, to tell us what's going on, what's its functionality. This is important. Write the memory flag, right? Why was that important? Well, remember our function, and hence why I showed you this. So you don't do that again. <laughs> and, of course, pull latitude, longitude from GPS data. Pull the depth from there, set up the writing process, and most importantly, anytime you transmit using SPI UARTs, anything like that, you could do all of the writing in, in ISRs. This is when you're transmitting, but you have to send the first byte, the first long word, the first whatever. You have to send that directly from a non ISR, and then the ISR will do all the future ones. All right, and that is it for this class.